thanks a lot for the kind invitation and I'm very delighted to be here and to and to present part of my uh, ongoing work which is also part of this uh, new uh, book manuscript uh, border abolitionist so uh, let me start by showing uh, the screen um, okay so i will start uh, with this um, website from unhcr algeria refugee camps and services managed uh, by refugees this is one of the um, uh, of the many uh, unhcr uh, programs um, and, and projects um, um, designed for involving uh, asylum seekers and refugees in uh, in the management of their own camps and in a way uh, of their own uh, displacement um, so, uh, and this is, I think, is very telling, right? In this, in this uh, website, UNHCR Algeria argues the refugee communities plays a major role in the provision of humanitarian support, wherever possible, be empowered to design, implement, and manage projects for the people that concern them the most, their own community. So, this is, as I said, only one of the many. Uh, <clears throat> context where uh, UN in which UNHCR engage with uh, so-called participatory approaches apt at involving refugees in decision making processes and these participatory approaches uh, get nowadays center stage on the agenda of international agency and NGOs so here I'm interested in um, asking in exploring what does participation mean in such a context and how are asylum seekers co-opted into their own control and governance so um, let me start with this sharing uh, this. Um, so I slightly changed the title of the presentation, which is Destructive Humanitarianism, Participatory Confinement and Refugee Digital Unpaid Labor. Um, I replaced the term uh, con uh, detention with confinement, and I will explain uh, why. Um, so. Here, I'm interested in uh, conceptualizing the involvement of asylum seekers into their own governance and control activities in terms of participatory confinement. Uh, because I, I, I understand confinement uh, broader than detention, right? There are modes of confinement that do not necessarily involve uh, detention, strictly uh, speaking. So participatory confinement designates the, the active incorporation of asylum seekers into their own governmentality and in the, reign of, in the name of their own good. And this is a very important element so that they are not simply coerced to uh, take part to these activities. Participatory confinement can be considered a form of soft control grounded, however, in clear cut asymmetrical relationship between humanitarian actors um, and state authorities on the one side and refugees and asylum seekers on the other. So it's important to retain the specificity of um, refugee humanitarianism in comparison to other fields, other sectors in which these forms of soft control take place. And this participatory confinement has increasingly become a key border technology of refugee humanitarianism. It's not just a marginal uh, aspect. Indeed, uh, participatory confinement uh, refers to the fact that all this participation of refugees reinforce confinement uh, and um, through their own, uh, if you want, um, activities, but also, as I will explain, what can be defined in terms of um, uh, unpaid labor, invisible uh, un unpaid labor. And here, I mean, I, mean um, I know that this is a topic that might uh, uh, um, connect with them. Um, with the main uh, also focus of this summer school, I build on a feminist scholarship on unpaid labor uh, and invisible labor to conceptualize um, these uh, forms of volunteering. So participatory confinement, I suggest, should be read uh, in the frame of the predominantly extractive character of refugees humanitarianism. Um, that is, refugee humanitarianism is, is grounded on knowledge and, and data extraction processes. That is this main uh, aspect of refugee humanitarianism nowadays, that is um, the, the predominance of extractive processes. Um, however, even if here I focus mainly on refugee camps, uh, refu uh, this, this extractive operation extend far beyond the refugee camp and concern the different step of the so-called migration journey. So when migrants encounter 
migration and state agency upon landing, but also along the route, as well as at the internal frontiers of Europe. That is, migrants are constantly interpolated and asked to speak to provide information about um, their life coping strategies and tactic, tactics of uh, border crossing. And this information is then used by this agency uh, to create statistics, reports, and so-called risk analysis. So following Sandra Mezzadra and Brett Nielsen, I conceive extractive operation, not only when the operation of capital, I quote from, um, from their most uh, recent book, plunder the materiality of the earth and biosphere, but also when they encounter and draw upon forms and practices of human cooperation and sociality that are external to them. Similarly, scholars have recently introduced the expression of digital extractivism to refer to, refer to forms of exploitation based on di digitization of commodities and services through digital capitalism, pointing to continuities with colonial modes of extractivism of natural resources and land grabbing. Digital labor and data extraction are part of digital extractivism. Along this line, as I will show, systematic knowledge extraction from refugees and refugees invisible digital labor, I suggest are part of these digital extractive processes. So I'm interested in foregrounding the subtle forms of containment and subjugation enhanced through knowledge and data extraction from refugees and the unpaid labor that these latter end up doing. So um, building on this, I investigate how refugees are encouraged to do unpaid labor activities in the name of their own good. And which forms, as I said, of subjugation, subtle form of subjugation, because most of these, uh, I mean, the, the way in which asylum seekers are uh, uh, subjected to subtle coercion, most of the time is invisible precisely because um, uh, these activities are um, uh, based on voluntary uh, participation, right? And in the name of refugees on good. So, refugees on good, uh, by that, I mean, both. Um, I mean, there is this sort of economy of the prom promise, right? So if you do this, you might have some advantage for in terms of your asylum application in an indirect way, or in order to get some kind of additional humanitarian support, but also overall as a contribution to the refugee uh, community, right? To improve uh, refugee, uh, I mean, uh, refugee governance. Uh, um, so, and I focus, so I focus on two interrelated aspects of extractive humanitarianism, participatory confinement and refugees unpaid labor, showing how these two are mutually intertwined and how uh, both these extractive activities are encouraged in the name of uh, refugees improvement. So um, let me start by conceptualizing participatory uh, confinement. In a lecture delivered at the University of Montreal in 1976, Michel Foucault discussed alternatives to the prison, highlighting that as part of this, I quote, there is an attempt to make prisoners themselves participate in devising the very programs for their punishment through the prisoner's council and so on. This is the idea that the individual, singly or collectively, is meant to accept the punitive procedure. End of quote. So Foucault's critique of the alternatives to prison and of the participatory rational act that involving prisoner in an active way uh, into their own incarceration foregrounds precisely what I here define participatory confinement mechanism. Of course, there are uh, differences, uh, qualitative difference between, differences between the imprisonment that Foucault refers to in jails and modes of uh, migration confinement and refugees confinement. Um, and however, I think that these uh, critical insight by Foucault helps precisely in problematizing uh, these modes of participation. And in particular, start, starting from the assumption that, as I said earlier, confinement is not narrow to detention. This is a, a gen I mean, uh, in general, right? In migration governance, there are hybrid forms of confinement, some of which are uh, may, might be seen as forms of like hidden um, uh, detention or uh, um, spaces like the hotspot uh, in uh, Greece uh, or in Italy where migrants are not formally officially detained but where uh, freedom of movement is highly restricted. And for instance, just to give you a concrete example, at the moment um, in Greece, I just came back from my field work there on the island of Lesbos, uh, asylum seekers are contained uh, in the new camp of Lesbos that has been the, 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 the previous hotspots was, was set on fire precisely one year ago. And now uh, in this new camp, 
uh, migrants are not allowed um, to go out. Uh, all these people are asylum seekers, so they are legally uh, on the Greek territory uh, and they are waiting right, for the results of the asylum application and they're not allowed to go out apart from twice per week, each in the name of COVID. So they can go out of the camp only if they test themselves. So they do a COVID-19 rapid test, even if at the moment there are zero cases inside the hotspot, and even those who are fully vaccinated. And they can go out only if they have uh, reasons. And by reason, it means medical reason or uh, to meet a lawyer. Um, so this is not officially a closed camp. It's not a detention center, but however, as you can see, their freedom of movement um, is extremely restricted. Uh, and is extremely restricted also in the name of their own protection, right? This is how the authorities justify. We keep them here to protect citizens from um, migrant contagion and to protect migrants themselves, right? Um, so there is this uh, very odd uh, intertwining between protection and confinement. Um, <clears throat> So um, in this as a refugee camp, uh, asylum seekers are increasingly asked to answer, for instance, questionnaires and provide detailed information about their life coping strategies, their migratory journeys, the logistics of border crossing, as well as about their protection needs. So there are, I mean, they are constantly interpolated by NGOs and in particular, as I just mentioned, UNHCR plays a key role in this participatory approach. Um, the push towards migration governmentality enacted from below and in a participatory way is nowadays widespread. Um, participatory confinement um, is based, as I said, mainly on this knowledge extraction. Um, and this uh, knowledge extraction is, uh, is, um, is, is used uh, in particular for generating um, uh, report statistics about, for instance, refugees' profiles, but also uh, the European agency Frontex use this knowledge extracted from migrants in order to generate what they call a risk analysis. So in the book, The Undercommons, um, scholars Fred Morton and Stefano Arne point to, I quote, the invitation to governmentality that subjects are repeatedly exposed to. So this concept of invitation to government, governmentality refer to uh, the, the fact that there is this constant way of transfer of responsibility and immaterial labor. Um, so in a way, uh, as a subject, individuals are uh, asked to collaborate to their own governmentality, right? But in this way, in, this, in the name of uh, collaboration and participation, they end up in strengthening the mechanism through which they are uh, controlled. Um, so elaborating such a notion further, it can be argued that the invitation to governmentality refers to the uh, unpaid labor, invisible labor that uh, some people do when they are involved in participatory activities to provide feedback about services and they implicitly consent to be object of knowledge destruction that is used for further enforcing modes of control and governance. Speaking of an invitation to governmentality enables also shedding light on the multiple forms of interpolation that individuals are object of, and how they are nudged to participate in the name of their own good. Um, the mode of participatory confinement, which are at play in refugee humanitarianism, can be analyzed in the frame of such an invitation of, uh, to governmentality that asylum seekers, like many others, right? Like, it's not specific, this invitation to governmentality of the refugee sector. Uh, are targeted by. However, as I said, uh, I think there is a specific uh, specificity of refugee humanitarianism, which consists precisely in this uh, asymmetry, right, between humanitarian actors and refugees, but also in the fact that asylum seekers are there because they, of course, are waiting, right, to, to receive a response about their asylum application. So, uh, as you can imagine, the, um, the boundaries between coercion and consent is extremely blurred in this case, right? Uh, what does it mean to be uh, willing to participate within such a context? Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, the peer-to-peer -peer mode of subjugation among subjects which informs the invitation to governmentality discourse is substantially altering the, in the refugee setting. Um, uh, indeed, asylum seekers are invited to participate to different activities by an international agency, which in fact strengthened this, precisely also this constant dependency, right, on humanitarian actors. 
um, related to that, one of the specific features uh, of participatory approach in the field of asylum is that this strengthened the exclusionary politics of refugee confinement. So precisely for the reason, I suggest to uh, inflect this term of invitation to governmentality in terms of participatory confinement. Uh, and now let's move on to uh, discuss where this uh, participatory approach comes from, right? So here in my research, I'm particularly interested in how uh, this participatory approach have been um, enhanced uh, also by, um, by the use of um, the widespread use of uh, digital technologies in refugee camp, and I, and I will explain in which sense. And however, it's important to clarify that participatory approaches are not new practices of governmentality. Uh, the repeated interpolation of refugees um, uh, in order to involve them into their own confinement didn't start with the so-called techno-humanitarianism, right? Uh, but actually it started um, uh, in the late 90s. Uh, uh, in 2002, the tax UNHCR evaluation policy remarks that refugee would need to be actively participant in, I quote, the identification, planning, implementation, and utilization of evaluation projects. A case in point in this regard is constituted by UNHCR participatory assessment approach, according to which refugees, internally displaced persons and returnees must be at the center of decision making uh, processes concerning their protection and well being. So, this um, uh, participatory assessment approach is also uh, still used nowadays, so almost, I mean, 20 years later. Uh, and I will show in a few minutes uh, how precisely. In the last decade, the Martina, participatory turn has just been... To, Martina, we, we can't see your screen, but just uh, so you know. Ah, sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, in the last decade, the participatory turn has been further pushed forward in refugee governance through, as I said, also the implementation of digital technologies. Uh, but also through uh, an approach that has been defined by refugees study scholar as uh, an approach by refugees to refugees. That is, asylum seekers are not only encouraged to provide information about their experience, they are also encouraged to actively fill in the gaps, to fix the broken system, as well as to uh, not to be uh, passive beneficiaries. So there is this push um, uh, to be uh, to not to be uh, a passive beneficiaries and in some way to do some work right uh, to fix uh, problems in camps and this is an important point to introduce the aspect of uh, unpaid uh, labor um, so uh, they are also, asylum seekers are also expected to actively mobilize and work for fixing infrastructural lacks in camps for instance alex bat and colleagues contend that is important uh, to move beyond a quote, a humanitarian that is still premise upon a strong separation between the provider and the beneficiary. Um, so um, participatory confinement does not only involve subtle coercion, it is also about hidden and unpaid labor that asylum seekers are pushed to perform to, to, to find a solution to the withdrawal of humanitarian. That is, they are nudged to cope with the lack of humanitarian and medical assistance as well as with what uh, geographer Ruth Gilmore called the organized abandonment enforced by states and international agencies. Um, and I think it's very relevant that this participatory approach started at the same time uh, in humanitarian agency um, that when uh, so the, this, the centrality of self-reliance, right, started to emerge in UNHCR. Um, so self-reliance, as the ability of individual or community to meet their essential needs and enjoying their human rights in a society. stable manner and to live with um, when they uh, started, when they started to be uh, implemented. So I think it's important not to not, not to um, downplay uh, this vocabulary, this discourse, and I think it's important to take them seriously, precisely for uh, critically engaging, the, uh, engaging with the consequences uh, on refugees' lives um, of, of, this, of this like participatory 
uh, approach. Uh, and because, as I said, um, a participatory uh, confinement um, is extended to the whole field of refugee uh, humanitarian. Um, as, just to give you an example, when migrants land, uh, for instance, in Italy or in Spain or in Greece, uh, the first one of the first um, uh, um, uh, um, persons that they encounter are the officers of the um, uh, European Agency Frontex. They ask them question about uh, not only where they are from, but about um, how much do you pay to come to Europe without what they call the briefing activities, which is precisely what I just described, right? The interview of information for instance, purposes for, for migrants willing to cooperate. Uh, um, and at the same time, they do ask migrants to provide their Facebook account or Twitter. I was saying that um, Frontex, the European agency, uh, conduct these debriefing activities, which are defined as the systematic extraction of information for intelligence purposes from migrants willing to cooperate. And they also uh, extract information from uh, migrant uh, social media. And of course, there are people who refuse to give to them uh, their Facebook account. But as you can imagine, it's not, again, there is this strong asymmetry. I imagine people just landed after a traumatic uh, journey uh, at sea, and they are asked to provide their, uh, their uh, social media accounts, right? So what does it mean consent, right, in this, uh, in this, um, in this context? Um, so now, well, I have another couple of slides, um, but let's stick, if you prefer, let's, uh, let's stick to, the, to audio only. So now let's move on to um, these uh, forms of uh, unpaid labor and also digital unpaid labor uh, that uh, asylum seekers um, perform uh, as part of the humanitarian. So scholars um, uh, in the field of critical security studies and migration uh, scholarship has, have investigated um, um, the use of digital technology. So how these digital technologies are incorporated to control asylum seekers and migrants. Um, here I'm more interested to shift from an exclusive focus on surveillance towards the political economy uh, and also the economy of labor, which is at stake in techno humanitarian, because I think this is uh, a bit like um, invisibilized, right? This, this, uh, which kind of modes of exploitation and labor are at stake in techno humanitarian is beyond the very fact that migrants might be trucked, right? Are trucked actually. Um, but this is not the only purpose, right, of uh, this technology. Um, so it, it, in order to, uh, to understand uh, this point, um, uh, I think, as I said, that family scholarship, uh, scholarship on unpaid labor offers a, a relevant analytical lens for coming to grips, grips with the invisible work performed by asylum seekers, as well as with the blurred boundaries between consent and coercion. So there are, of course, uh, many places, many, many sites in which migrants are um, uh, exposed to um, uh, violent forms of labor exploitation, uh, both so-called illegalized migrants and, and refugees, right? Uh, and the, I mean, many scholars have investigated this. Migrants become, uh, as long as they are turned into illegalized uh, um, uh, um, migrants, they also become cheap labor force, right? This is uh, um, uh, well known. However, there are also uh, other ways in which they are co-opted in uh, forms of um, exploitation, which uh, are more invisibilized because they are not so blatant, right? Uh, it's not only about like, it's not of the same level of migrants being exploited in the countryside or pick up like fruits, right? For uh, just like a few euros per day. Uh, but there, is, there are also uh, more subtle forms and invisible forms of um, very low paid work or unpaid uh, work. Um, so uh, the analytics of unpaid labor enables making invisible work and exploitation visible and at once is the first step to start to refuse extraction of labor from individuals. Uh, so therefore, uh, unpaid labor, this category does much more than pointing to the unwaged labor performed by asylum seekers and claiming that they should be remunerated. Together with that, it also challenges the social expectation towards asylum seekers as individuals who should behave as active citizens and work for free while they are uh, without rights. 
So the Digital Innovation Service at UNHCR is in charge of devising and experimenting technologies in refugee camps with the official goals of improving refugees' access to connectivity and to streamline the communication between humanitarian workers and asylum seekers. So uh, here I want to uh, point to a specific aspect, one of these uh, implementation, right, of digital innovation by UNHCR. Um, well, I have, um, I mean, I can show uh, their website page on this, but if you want, I can show later when the talk is finished in order not to, um, I mean, to have problems with connectivity now. So in 2017, UNHCR implemented chatbots in some refugee camps, in particular in Lebanon and in Jordan, presenting these as new interfaces of communication between asylum seekers and humanitarian actors. The use of chatbots is justified by their flexibility, which allow, uh, I quote, for iteration and adaptation in response to feedback. More than aspiring at full automation in humanitarian context, artificial intelligence is used in this case for extracting knowledge from refugees in a systematic way and for nudging UNHCR's beneficiaries to provide feedback and react to specific questions. Uh, as UNHCR stressed on its website, through engagement with refugees via digital platforms, humanitarian responders can provide not only um, critical life-saving information um, to refugees, but also establish a dialogue in which refugees can provide their insight, feedback, and priorities. And it's interesting that these UNHCR initiatives build on the World Food Program, mobile vulnerability assessment mapping. So there is this, as I mentioned before, uh, these humanitarian uh, participatory approaches uh, comes from, stems from the development sector, right? And we can still see now how there is this constant uh, exchange. Um, so uh, this, also this World Food Program chatbot is set for providing relevant information uh, about, uh, for instance, food price or food distribution programs. But at the same time, it also extracts specific data from users as it asks as it asks them to say their location, specific gender, nationality, and other personal uh, information. Um, so the fact that asylum seekers interact with humanitarian actors via the chatbot does not mean that they are coerced to do that. Uh, indeed, uh, of course, they always can say no, right? But it is interesting to see how these um, digital uh, interfaces are more and more becoming the only channel through which asylum seekers can communicate with uh, humanitarian actors. And this is, for instance, is also the case in Greece. Uh, I'm happy to explain more because this is I mean, where I'm currently doing my fieldwork. Uh, I can explain more uh, uh, in detail in which sense, so in how they can communicate uh, with, um, with NGOs. Um, another uh, interesting example, uh, uh, is uh, still, I mean, by UNHCR, um, uh, by keeping this focus on Jordan. So in 2019, uh, UNHCR's Innovation Service launched a participatory digital map making project for refugees in Zatari camp. Zatari camp is one of the biggest refugee camps uh, in the world, where at the moment there are about 8,000 asylum seekers um, currently stranded, mainly Syrians. Um, so this participatory digital mapping project is called GIS. From uh, uh, tested, that, which is tested by UNHCR, um, and I think it's, it constitutes a very good case in point of activities based on asylum seekers' digital unpaid labor. The project is presented by the UN agency as the first project to empower refugees to use mapping technologies by giving refugees the tools to use mapping for improved decision making. As part of the project, refugees are encouraged to gather information and map the camp in order then for UNHCR to understand the infrastructural problems of the camp, as well as refugees' needs. So uh, in this case, what, what this refug, refug, I mean, refugee IS uh, uh, con, uh, encapsulates is this push for refugees, not only to participate, but also to, to do um, some uh, labor, right? Uh, showing through the map the infrastructural problems to fix in the camp, such as lack of water or electricity supplies or internet connectivity. And by, I quote from UNHCR, enhancing skills, including cartography, data visualization, collection and analysis. So there is this further layer, right? It's not only about, I mean, uh, 
questioning if voluntary activity is really uh, voluntary, but also understanding that there is this attempt to ask uh, refugees to fix uh, their problems uh, uh, in, in camps. Now, uh, the second case study that I want to briefly speak about, so it is Jordan and UNHCR, and now let's shift to Greece, that as I said, um, is, uh, is my uh, case study, right? So uh, since 2015, as um, some of you might know, um, the Greek refugee context has progressively turned into a space of protracted confinement for women, men, and children who seek asylum in Europe. In fact, while in 2016, uh, the Greek island were a kind of transit point, right, in migrants' journey to Northern Europe, with the progressive closure of the Balkan route and with the signature of the EU Turkey deal in March 2016, many migrants remain entrapped on the Greek island of Lesbos, Chios, Kos, and Samos, where the, EU, the European Commission opened the hotspot the year before, uh, in summer 2015. Um, hotspots are located at the moment in Greece, for those I mean, for, of you who are not familiar, um, in Greece and in Italy, and are basically centers where, uh, again, are not officially closed centers. They are centers where migrants are should be quickly identified and uh, partitioned between those who uh, claim asylum and those who um, uh, don't and who sh should be returned. But the situation is much uh, more complicated than that in reality how these spaces uh, function. For instance, in Greece, uh, many people who claim asylum are not actually allowed to claim asylum because they are subjected to uh, what uh, um, Greece called inadmissibility procedure. So mainly they are is decided on the basis of their nationality that they are not allowed to even uh, lodge an asylum claim which is, of course, against the Geneva Convention, right? So uh, there, at the moment, there are five nationalities. Somali, uh, um, uh, uh, so pe people from Somalia, Bangladesh, um, Afghanistan, uh, Syria, and Pakistan uh, were not allowed to even uh, lodge an asylum application. So they are preventively legalized. And in principle, they should be returned to Turkey because uh, Turkey, since June 2021, is considered a safe country for them. But actually, Turkey is currently not accepting um, these forced returns uh, anymore. Um, uh, so they are stuck, right, on this island. Um, so the situation is much more complicated than uh, our hotspot have been uh, described by the European uh, Commission. Um, so, and what is interesting is that in these camps, um, asylum seekers um, are, um, are um, first of all, many of them are encouraged, are pushed to do some voluntary work uh, in a way like in a more traditional way, if you want, voluntary work in the sense of, for instance, taking part, running, managing small activities in the camps, for instance, managing the laundry services in the camp and managing the queues of other refugees who want to use the laundry machine, right? So these are uh, clear, clear cases of voluntary work, right? And, and now being this voluntariness, this being volunteer actually should be questioned in light of, as I said, of what does it mean to consent to do this work and also this economy of the promise. So the, the idea that if you, if you volunteer, you might have some benefit, right? you might have some advantage. Then there are also other ways in which asylum seekers, more invisible way, in which asylum seekers in Greece are asked to participate, right, to, um, uh, to their own confinement. So uh, I want to focus on a particular aspect. Um, uh, in 2017, the European Commission launched the Refugee Cash Assistance Program in collaboration with UNHCR and with the financial actors prepaid financial services based in London. So this program, as part of this program, asylum seekers in Greece uh, receive a financial support, which is um, top up, up um, on their uh, on a debit card, uh, sorry, on a prepaid card. So they receive these prepaid cards, which is sponsored by MasterCard, and every month they receive this small financial support. Um, and this is, of course, part of the current digitalization of refugee humanitarianism, which in Greece is progressive, is progressing quite a lot. 
uh, and I'm happy uh, to tell something a bit more in the Q&A because after COVID, there has been an, a further boost in this digitalization of the asylum system, of asylum bureaucratic procedures. And it's very interesting uh, to notice that actually this digitalization is far from streamlining refugees' access to asylum, but actually represent a further barrier. So asylum seekers are uh, obstructed through technology from getting access to asylum services. Um, so I need to think about this digitalization not as something that is improving refugees' lives, and not only as something for surveilling, monitoring, right? But also as a series of obstacles, right? Uh, and all this takes place, uh, this, I, this digitalization and this idea of like, I mean, providing refugees with debit cards as if they were consumers, right? Uh, while they are actually uh, almost incarcerated in these camps or anyway on this island. And I think it's very interesting to notice how these uh, carceral geographies and this digitalization take place at the same time. So um, they receive these cards. Um, and after receiving the cards, UNHCR conducts what they call post-distribution monitoring activities. Um, so positive simulation monitoring activities are um, uh, conducted by UNHCR in many places across the globe. And these activities are defined by UNHCR as activities, I quote, to collect and understand refugees' feedback on the assistance provided by humanitarian agency like UNHCR, to identify challenges and constraints experienced and seek refugees' feedback of, on any improvements required. So in Greece, UNHCR uh, conduct these uh, post distribution monitoring activities um, on uh, with car beneficiaries so with those who receive the cards right so they ask them to participate to interviews focus group and survey in the name of um, uh, improving the service right for instance um, uh, the survey um, that is given to refugees is formed by 130 multiple choice questions uh, in which refugees are asked to tick the box right um, to choose among like a pre-established answer um, about, and this question concern, well, first of all, basic uh, data like, okay, tell us our, your gender, age, uh, nationalities, but also for, for grasping, capturing detailed information, which include among others, education background of each family member, their li daily life coping strategy, for instance, how they spend the money, how much they manage to save per month, the travel time to get to the shop uh, and jobs that they are do doing in the black market. For instance, asylum seekers are asking what way as the cash card increase your sense of safety. Um, as anyone in your family had to employ any of the following practices in the following in the last month, such as begging, uh, exploitative works, uh, accept or accepting other, uh, I mean, some dangerous uh, jobs. Uh, so this kind of um, uh, information, uh, this kind of uh, activities is conducted systematically uh, by, uh, by UNHCR, which selects some, I mean, the, the, the people, right, to interview. Uh, and of course, none of these uh, activities is uh, uh, mandatory. As asylum seekers can choose whether or not to participate, they receive phone calls, right? And there are people who completely disregard UNHCR saying, I mean, I don't care, I'm here, I'm just in transit, right? I don't care about participating to these activities because they are aware that it, they are not receiving anything back. So I think that this is a very key aspect of this, um, of the refugee humanitarianism. They are constantly interpolated and asked to speak, but they don't receive anything back, right? Not from not only from an economic point of view, right? They are not remunerated, but also in terms of rights or some improvements. And of course, uh, many of them know this. Others do accept to do that because they don't know what happens if they say no, right? If they deny, if they deny their consent, they are scared of that this might have some uh, consequence on their asylum application. Um, so this is the, the, the economy of the promise, of the promise is inflected in, this, in, the, in the refugee setting by this uh, potential blackmailing so that refugees on the one hand are, do not receive anything back and on the other, they are scared of what might happen uh, to them. Um, so 
um, it, the promise that its refugees do participate to voluntary activities, this will benefit. So this will bring some benefit to them. Is intertwined with refugees' fear if they don't do not take part, something might happen uh, uh, to them. And easy, so in this regard, I want to um, uh, focus on the fact to highlight uh, an important point that asylum seekers' speech is constantly discredited, as uh, many scholars have I mean, work on. Um, for instance, on asylum seekers, right, on asylum interviews have demonstrated. So there is this production of the refugees as a deceitful subject, right? And in this regard, I think that Fanon's work on, um, I mean, the, the treatment of the colonized resounds echoes, right? How, uh, as, uh, for instance, um, the anthropologist Roberto Beneduce uh, uh, stressed, um, so the speech uh, of and uh, and of the refugees is constantly discredited, and the refugees is always assumed to be deemed to be a subject to lies or is not able to tell the truth. However, at the same time, refugees are as constantly asked to speak, and not only at the moment of the asylum interview, uh, but all along their uh, migratory journey. Right, so there is this need of extracting knowledge from them, um, and I think this is a not a paradox, but precisely specificity of the power relations in the in refugee sectors. So uh, going towards the conclusion, um, in I mean, re reflecting on the ethical and political implication of partici participatory approaches in, in a completely different setting. So in machine learning, Moan Sloan has introduced the concept of participatory washing to describe the power and economic asymmetries reiterated and reinforced by involving users into design processes. Relatedly, participatory washing refers to the ghost work that individuals copied in participatory approaches perform. So here I think is interesting uh, to see precisely how uh, this participatory confinement, both this element of subtle coercion and unpaid work uh, are at stake. And now, I mean, the kind of similarities that we can trace with other uh, sector uh, while retaining at the same time the specificity of being in a refugee sector. Um, the participatory confinement dimension rely, relies on the fact that by taking part to those activities um, um, with the promise that this will benefit them and improve the refugee system, asylum seekers are co-opted in the strengthening of mechanism of containment. Um, and this, uh, as I said, should be traced back to this shift in the late uh, 90s, right? That comes from the development uh, sector. Um, the invitation to governmentality is nowadays widespread, far beyond refugee governance, and resisting is not an easy task. Indeed, as I have illustrated, this is predicated upon this economy of the promise. If you do this, this will benefit you in the near future. Um, refugees are repeatedly asked to speak, even if their speech is often deemed to be untruthful, and they are de facto pushed to do unpaid labor in order to fix their own displacement and to generate relevant knowledge for international agencies. Um, circumventing and resisting participatory confinement is at times the result of local and individual tactics, so of refusal, for instance, people who refuse, asylum seekers who refuse and say, no, I don't, I'm not interested, right? However, the stake that participatory confinement confronts us with is broader than individual resistances. As Michel Foucault pointed out in the text that I cited earlier, right, about refugees, sorry, um, prisoners participation to uh, the prison system, it is a matter of interrogating how not to strengthen, reproduce, and legitimize coercive mechanisms by requiring individuals to participate to their own confinement. Okay, thanks a lot. I uh, finish here for now.